Hi everyone, I hope that you are enjoying upcoming autumn days and I'm here to invite you for a little talk about education. Nowadays there are many ways of education. Some are more usual than others and each might have its pros and cons because each family is so different and has the diverse needs, possibilities and limitations. One of the possible ways how to educate children is homeschooling. Parents who are interested in self-directed education for their children often face many initial obstacles beginning from the lack of self-trust, trust to their children, to the lack of real experience in their close environment. And this is also the reason why we want to offer you this talk with a world-famous author of the book Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves, Naomi Aldert. Naomi Aldert raised her three sons without schooling and all three graduated universities with excellence. She has been the keynote speaker at many homeschooling and unschooling conferences worldwide. She is a very inspirational speaker and her guidance brings peace and clarity to difficult situations as well to ordinary parenting issues. The result is deep parent-child connection, peace, and powerful self-reliant content children doing their best not because they fear us or seek our approval but because they want of their own free will you can connect with naomi from your home through skype or phone sessions or you can also visit her completely new website naomialdor.com which is full of articles mp3s and videos you can find here also this wonderful set of cds about homeschooling called Trusting Our Children, Trusting Ourselves. And this year you have unique possibility to meet her in person on private sessions, on her workshops, on her European tour starting this September. And if you want to learn more about self-directed learning, democratic schools and unschooling, I can recommend you also visiting the website of the organization Svoboda Uceni in English it's called Freedom to Learn, which is the only organization striving for legalization of those forms of education in our country. Or you can read the book Free to Learn, why unleashing the instincts to play will make our children happier, more self-reliant, better students for life, which is a compilation of essays from American psychologist and research professor Peter Gray. Also, this book was translated into Czech. I will give you all the important links for the books, CDs, events and organization into the description. And now we can fully immerse in today's talk. Enjoy watching! So, thank you for having me and let's, uh, let's hear your questions. Okay, uh, today I would like to talk to you about the self-directed learning and unschooling. I know you have such experience with your own children and you have also worked with many, many families around the world and helped parents with their parenting issues. Uh, I also read an article from you uh, which was called The Ethics of Representing Childhood in Western Culture, which is great and even translated into Czech language. I will put the link below. Uh, you clearly describe the process of mistrusting children, that it begins from birth, then when you don't trust your ch child, for example, when to nurse, and when and where to sleep, and that we as parents tend to obediently follow instruction, instructions and uh, questionable advice from the experts and so-called authorities. Uh, and for example, that we compel our kids, to, for example, to say goodbye, thank you, and force them to share their own things, even if they refuse it at first, and so on. So as you wrote, the traditional schools are just the logical result of this mistrust and belief that children are not okay as they are, and you have to change and push them somehow into some stage that you like. Um, I know you have three sons, um, and no, none of them uh, attended neither um, elementary nor high school, right? Mm -hmm. um, but all of them got to the universities, some of them even for a full scholarship, which is great. 
Uh, can you explain me how is this possible? Are older kids some miracle exception? Or what yeah. impact had the respectful environment where they lived and the time that they had to pursue their own interests? Yeah, so that's a very, very wonderful way to start because not only they're not exceptions, but actually the rule. Typically, the, some of the most successful students in universities are those who were homeschooled uh, because they love learning. They didn't, it wasn't shoved into them for 12 years, so they didn't develop an aversion to it. Yes, they right. Forced to learn what they don't want to learn. They actually kept the same curiosity of the two years old who drives you nuts because they want to learn so much and know everything, or the three years old who asks questions endlessly why, 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 mommy, daddy? They don't lose that. So they come to the college. And they're generally on the dean's list in America. That means the best students. Uh, and, and they do more homework they're being asked because they're so enthused and so excited about it. Uh, also, when you look at least in the United States, where there is a lot of homeschoolers and unschoolers, uh, and you look at um, all kind of academic competitions, often the winners are homeschoolers. My own youngest son, he was on a program on TV uh, for prodigies, and they chose four prodigies that they searched from the whole of Washington State to put on the TV program and show. So they show my son, a musician. He was nine years old at the time. He showed an author, a seven years old, who already wrote a full book of stories. Wow. And he showed an artist who was her pictures were already selling for thousands and thousands of dollars. Amazing. Uh, and she was 10. And they showed a 13 years old scientist who was already in college. Coincidentally, wow. all four of them, all four of them, homeschoolers. Oh, an accident. <laughs> well, but that accident can't, kept happening. Every time one of my children was a winner of something that we did, I mean, we were not in the competition, so it was mostly the young one who did his cello thing. The middle one did some composition competitions he, he liked and won. Uh, then often the winners, uh, you know, a good percentage of them were homeschoolers. They seem to be very successful, both socially academically, uh, if they create their own business or their own activities. I mean, there's a 13 years old speaking on TED, I think, a TED talk wow. um, that somebody showed me recently. I mean, they're very, and he talked about why being self-directed is why he can do so much and, uh, and succeed so well, because he's free and he can be for himself. And that's what he has learned all his life, to create his own life, not to be told what to do and follow, you know, and just do the homework and all of that. That's playing small. These kids are learning to relate to grown-ups and to think I would say like my kids are so politically involved. They think about the world and what they, can they do. My oldest son, uh, he's politically involved. He's a mentor. Uh, he's uh, participating and designing our town for the future uh, and doing political uh, social justice. Um, and all of them from the beginning so the bigger picture rather than so themselves as children who come into the world and have to obey and to be good and, be, and then finally maybe one day become these adults and be like everybody else the homeschooling children often right away see themselves as gee what will i be giving to the world to make a difference because they see the bigger picture and they're socially a lot more developed because they are right away in society rather than put in unusual, unnatural uh, setting that takes them away from society. And so they interact with adults and they interact with real life and with real problems rather than um, in an unnatural groupy thing where they're told what to do. Yes, I love that. So uh, all of them, of your sons, have jobs. 
uh, where they are satisfied, I guess. I want a little more information about my sons. <laughs> Remember, it's not an example because each person is different. You yes. know, you should probably, people can go online and see about homeschooling, do some Google about what happens to homeschoolers. They're scientists, they're leaders, people owning their own business. I mean, Edison was an inventor. He was a homeschooler, the inventor yeah. of the bulb, okay. of the light bulb. Uh, a lot of other, there is, if you write on Google, famous people who were homeschoolers, you'd get a huge list of phenomenal people. Uh, but as far as my own kids, my oldest son uh, was initially a social worker and worked in the city, uh, but he now works and lives on Orcas Island in some other job and doing a lot of volunteering, social justice and other things on, in our small community and decided to live here, just bought land and creating his home and very successful in everything he does. And he writes, he did some even little public speaking recently um, right. and, and moved the audience to tears. It was very honest and authentic. My second boy, uh, and this, this guy's 30. Uh, my second boy is 26 and he lives in Seattle and he works full time as a musician. Uh, as a pianist and a composer and a teacher, and he plays in the very, very top uh, places, restaurants uh, and events. And he's also a church musician conducting choir, um, playing the piano and the organ every Sunday. So he's, he's very busy, making good income, having a wonderful life. And the third one is only 23. And he's already uh, a second year member of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which is one of the best in the world and hardest to get into. He got into the Boston Symphony Orchestra at age 20. And that was quite a big buzz in magazines and some newspapers around the country because of being uh, so young. Uh, and he plays festivals. Uh, and he, they play around the world and he plays some chamber music uh, in Europe and in America and Canada, but mostly he's having a full-time job. 90% uh, so of what he does is uh, the Boston Symphony Orchestra and performing with them as a professional. Uh, he will be on our island, actually. We have an international music festival two weeks in August and he's often invited to that and he gets a little break from the tanglewood festival of the boston symphony to come here anyway he's a successful musician uh, and, uh, lives five minutes walk from the orchestra in a beautiful brownstone apartment uh, i love to hear the real examples because we cannot see such thing in our country it's uh, it's not yeah. legal here Yeah. I would like to ask you, um, plenty of people believe that you have to be a qualified teacher to homeschool your child. But I have to mention one thing that you said on uh, one of your CDs called Self-Directed Learning from the whole set called Trusting Our Children, Trusting Ourselves, which I highly recommend to everyone considering self-directed learning for their, their child. Uh, I will put also the link below. So you said, uh, pedagogy <laughs> is, the, is getting someone to learn what they don't want to learn. And basically, with, when you are a teacher, you know that you are spending time and looking, looking at tricks. How can we get these little people who are not interested in the subject because uh, they didn't choose to be there? Right. How can we get them to do it anyway? How do we force them and somehow do it in a way that it looks like, like we are having fun, which is another way to learn how to lie. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are those pedagogical techniques and tricks actually contributive or counterproductive to the learning process of the child? I think you already answered that question. <laughs> Because the way you <laughs> described it was so humorously clear how destructive they are. You mentioned that actually the child is learning to lie, but I'll add to what you say that we waste the child's time because the child would have used that same time that we're plucking them out of themselves to learn something they're not interested in. They would have used that time to learn something they are interested in. 
And that's, that's what would get them furthest away. You know, the reason uh, my youngest kid was already playing as a soloist with orchestras at age 10 is because he was pursuing his passion from age six on. And it was his own motivation or this kid that was on the TV show uh, at 13 in university, one of the best students doing science, is because he pursued science and he had 10 hours a day time. His mother said he was doing that like all day long. Not that he didn't eventually get to other subjects too, but the way humans learn is they become passionate about whatever this program in them that we don't have access to and we don't know what it is. And they pursue it with passion and they may do two years on one subject rather than dividing and cutting their span of attention by ringing a bell after one hour or 50 minutes and not letting them develop the long span of attention. Actually, they already have it. They were born, you know, when, when they want to learn some science and they're into it or build something from Plato or do a puzzle of 2,000 pieces like some children are totally able to do. If they do what they want to do, they, have, they can stay for hours on one thing yes right reading the book read them a book and they tell you read this page again. read this page and they fall in love with one page you have a three years old a four years old yes <laughs> all I the know. time and and who loses the patience first the parent <laughs> You know, and I tell parents, please read it to them as much as they want even if you lose your patience it's you who don't have a span of attention because you went to school and you watch TV and all this other modern way of life. Children are born with the longest span of attention. Yes, it's right. The other way around. I want to tell you a story that will really uh, accentuate this issue of span of attention that we got into. My oldest son, when he was six years old, he said in the summer he wants to take the recreation department um, classes. Were those once a week or twice a week you go to a class, uh, like, you know, for fun. So there was a science class with a teacher that put all these experiments out on the grass and the kids could do whatever they want, which was wonderful. And then he signed up for a music class, like improvisation music, and for art class. Um, and the music class, maybe I'll tell you later if it'll fit something we talked about, talk about because it's something different. But the art class was a two hours class long. And I brought him to the class and he said, you can go pick me up in two hours. When I pick him up in two hours, he's not there. He said, the door. I see all the kids, you know, with their art, etc. I see the teacher. I tell her, well, where is Jonathan? Where's my kid? He said, well, he misbehaved. So I punished him and he's up at the secretary's office. I excluded him from the class. So I, I already had a big smile on my face. <laughs> I mean, not in her face. So I'm starting to go upstairs and I see the legs of my of the secretary of my son because I heard his voice. He had a very high and happy voice. And he's talking to the secretary and having a great time. And I hear her saying to him, well, we'll see what your mother says, which he was not worried about, of course. <laughs> so he's coming down the stairs and, and without me asking anything, he says, mom, I had a great time with the secretary. <laughs> And I don't need the art class anymore because the, the teacher disturbs. At home, I can draw without interruption. So as we talked on the way back home, it turned out that the teacher had this idea that children has no span of attention. So every 15, 20 minutes, she interrupts and has to do something different. The first thing they did is they were painting. Well, he will get to paint for the two hours, right? But she wanted him to stop painting so she can tell some story about a bear. And then they would paint something different about the bear. Well, he didn't want to do that. And he's used to respect and autonomy. So when she says to him, you have to stop painting, he just like, what do you mean? 
I'm in charge of myself. I want to paint. So he, he kept painting, so she punished him, and he didn't see it as punishment because he's never been punished in his life. He doesn't have the concept. He just thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be the secretary. And he was a very talkative kid, very communicative, very social, and has no problem socially socializing with adults. He didn't have the concept that he can only talk to somebody of his own age. So the secretary was a perfect friend for him, and apparently he had a wonderful time and like he said he can from now on stay home and do his painting at home when nobody interrupts his long span of attention that's a great example I have, few, I have lots of stories of this kind by the way especially with this particular kid where uh he's so confident in the face of a teacher thinking that they can control him or a teacher just cutting span of attention when he's ready to go for hours and learn and learn and learn or do, do, do what he's excited about. Okay, great. So uh, what was actually your role as a homeschooling parent? How did you prepare the learning environment in order to help your children to be successful once in their lives? I think lots of people, especially those who hear about unschooling for the first time, they inter misinterpret it for neglecting. Yes. But, uh, can you explain the difference? Yes. Well, there are among homes homeschoolers, there are more the unschooling, which is, it's, you know, they would say it's not neglect, and for most of them it's not, or the, even the radical unschooling. And I'm not saying either one is neglect. It depends how they do it. And then there is the homeschoolers who like to engage with their children and have input and expose and maybe do some Uh, learning every day together. So there are different types of people. Personally, I um, didn't prepare anything day to day, but more followed rather than prepared. In other words, I would see what the kids are into and make sure to supply so their passion is getting fulfilled. So if I see a child who is sitting at the piano at age three, figuring out a piece of music, for hours and hours on end, by the way, with incredible patience, even pieces of Bach, you know, uh, so it took a long time and putting the hands together. Then, you know, then I take them to concerts. Then I okay. play music. Then I dance with them. Then maybe I join their play at the piano. Uh, and we do the different improvisation games that I've invented on their backs and that I teach to people who want their children and the children don't have to be especially talented in music. Everybody is talented in music to one degree or another and it's nurturing to everybody. I think that arts are really important to expose and allow the children. So we had art supplies, you know, Play-Doh, paints of all kinds, paper. We had, uh, we bought a roll of butcher Uh, paper and hung it off the wall because our oldest son was really into drawing and painting and he liked the big space. So that's what I mean by responding. It's not that I got up in the morning and I would think, what should I do with them today? It's more like I get up in the morning and see what will they do today? Okay. On what ride will they take me And what will I have to come up with in order to support so that they are engaged and have what they need because they are passionate and they want to learn and they want, you know, like my middle son went through some years when he was little where numbers, numbers, numbers. All he wanted is counting. He explained all kind of relativity in his own words. He didn't know it was relativity. And he tried to add numbers on the steam of the windows. And, you know, it's like they do things. So, I, okay, so I bought some cards or multiplications. I, you know, I created, you know, and then he engaged in it. And I noticed that he multiplies. So, so I drew a multiplication table and showed, gave him two examples how it works and, and nothing else and left him alone with it. He filled up the rest of it because he loves to. And I never told him to memorize it, but rather told him the logic of it. Like if you do three times eight, well, you go eight, then you add another eight, then you add another eight. 
you know, count it, put blocks, whatever, however you want to do it. It was quite little. So he did that. So he could figure out the whole multiplication table. And it was very exciting for him. And he made not a single mistake. It was really interesting. And then he said that it was too easy now. And he wants a big one. He was 100 by 100. And I used the butcher paper to do a 50 by 50. There was no room for 100 by 100. Because I had to make the numbers pretty big for a young child, not, not small. So, uh, but anyway, and then he worked on the 50 by 50. He didn't finish it, but there were no mistakes. I mean, it, it becomes endless. It's just a lot, a lot of work. But he got how to do it. And then a few years later, he showed me he was adding numbers. He wrote numbers of like 10 digits or, or seven digits, like millions. And he would add them correctly and then check on the calculator. And he added them from left to right. And we learned in school to add them from right to left. But we learned it like robots, like that's how you do it. And you take the extras and you move them, etc. I have never, I was good at math, but I never understood this issue with the extras and how it all happens. It was magic to me. Like, okay, you take the extra and you take the extra and somehow it comes right at the end. Well, this kid went from left to right and had to resolve the problem on his own of the extras then changing the final number on the left. So he explained it to me and for the first time in my life, I understood it. So he invented his own method. Exactly. And he, didn't, he never did it from right to left. He still did it from left to right, but he did something where he knew what the final number on the left is going to be. He said yes. he can tell from the last three digits. I, I don't even remember how he explained it. But basically, he had his own method. And it's finding a method that develops the brain and thinking more than any following somebody else's instructions. My children also taught themselves to read. Three different methods, three different ages. Each one developed their own method of how to read. Now, developing the method is genius. You know, people work in offices to develop books and methods how to teach kids to read. Well, they work for years on it. And here you get a six years old, four years old, eight and 10 years old, inventing reading methods, learning to read. That invention, is a brain developer and of course they know to read then fantastic because they actually get it just like with the numbers so i had three kids three different methods they invented the method i was not involved i read to them absolutely i had my finger under the letters a lot of the time yes absolutely i sang the abc uh, book uh, you know song the the mozart twinkle twinkle little star <laughs> in america that's what we do this. yes i know, I know that's this. the abc so anyway and had you know a is for this b is for this you know all kind of books with number games and with uh with uh, and we invented number games by the way and letter games and yeah so we i played with them but i played with them when they wanted to when they started it or when we were driving a car and had to go to our music lesson and drive for a whole hour or more, then, you know, they would beg me to do number games, you know, because it was fun. And, and I, you know, no, it's my turn. It's my turn. And the number games would be saying things like, okay, nine times three minus four divide, by, you know, and I had to calculate it so that at the end, when they come with the result, I can, compare and see if it's right. And of course, I could have made a mistake too. But anyway, so while driving in a car, while taking a walk, when they wanted to, when they asked for it, and because it was their desire, and they asked for it, and I was responding, they fought about it as strongly as fighting about a candy. I mean, we didn't have candy. That's a different subject. But as strong as fighting about a homemade sweet thing or going to the playground or you know getting a turn on the slide or on the swing uh, because it was their thing they wanted it so badly and we didn't do it so all the time 
Uh, so the other part of the answer is I also did nothing, but you asked about neglect. <laughs> you know, some neglect is good, uh, but it's not neglect then. We don't call it neglect. But you want to let them be and let them do their things. So we live here in a forest uh, on a hill. And it's safe. We live on an island. So living in the country, we moved here because of that. We wanted the children to have that freedom. So not everybody has that. But, you know, have a freedom inside your home. And if you live in a city, you know, there are other settings. You Or go to a playground or to a park and then sit and pretend to read the book so the kids don't feel like you're involved in what they're doing. They need to build castles. And, you know, one of my sons in the forest builds a wooden little house for himself. <laughs> that was his corner. You know, they climbed trees, they invented games, they collected slugs and fed them and then released yes. them. Uh, you know, in a box. They they ran around, they rode bicycles, they rode bicycles around and around and around and scooters and learned balance. And in the winter when there was snow, they, they sled down the hill on a sled and on plastic bags and whatever they could invent. Or they carried each other on a wagon and and then they played on their own, you know, board games. We had a lot of non-competitive board games and we also didn't teach them competition so even competitive games we played them mostly cooperatively like we did cooperative monopoly game <laughs> cooperative memory game we didn't have to teach them to do cooperative on memory they didn't know about competition yet so they they just helped each other and made one pile of all the cards that they matched they yes i loved it yeah, because instead of each it, one their own pile and, and wishing the other child wouldn't do it right, like in school. You know, in school, if a teacher asks a question, then Johnny raises his hand and then the teacher calls on Lila and not on him and he wishes that Lila would fail and give the wrong answer. So he socialization. That's right. So if you play memory and each one their own pile and now it's your brother's turn, to find a pair and you wish your brother would fail. A lot of what children learn in school, social skills, is to wish for the other person to fail and to want to win at all costs at the expense of others. And, you know, when they played memory game like this, they helped each other naturally because they're naturally cooperative. Yes, right. They're a social animal that want to produce together the final good result. You know, like playing in an orchestra, the individual isn't the subject. It's producing the music, the final phenomenal result that matters, not the individual. So we contribute and contribute. And two of my children plays in youth, played in youth orchestra from early age. So does that answer your question, give you enough of our... And we went to concerts and museums. So I say expose, but don't impose. Yeah, you know, exposed to things. So I exposed to more than, you know, you can't be led by the child if they don't know that something exists. Yes. So when I say I get up in the morning and I follow their path. Yeah, after I provide a huge library in the house and there is a library in town and we go to museums and we take trips, geography. We did a lot of just road trips. Uh, and go to nature and swim and dance. And uh, my children, I danced some African dance. And one of my children learned to drum, the African drumming, and actually started making money drumming for the class. <laughs> and, Great. They did, and they did uh, karate classes and were, you know, in and recorded, recorded um, recorder, like flute uh, group classes and you know so they chose what they wanted to do one of them was acting in a lot of theater productions uh, one of them sang in a choir for a little while um, two of them were in orchestras so it was out of following them but also constantly exposing to what's available within who I am within what I know and then when they got interested in things that I don't know, because I tried to expose yes. them to through books, then I would hire a teacher. I hired a biology a science teacher from high school to get together with my kids once a week and 
answer their questions and going to nature. And the homeschooler group here, we got together socially, we did camping trip, we went to uh, all kinds of places like the aquarium and studied. And we have on our island, one of the astronauts that worked on the, that was on the moon lives here. Wow, great. A lot of astronomy, yeah, he would bring his fat books and tools and stuff uh, and we'll be together looking up at the sky and comparing to what he was teaching them in the books, etc. So all kinds of opportunities that would show up and it's amazing how much shows up and how much we parents learn with our children. Um, it, oh my goodness, I didn't know half as much even of music and I play piano and sing, but through my kids, I've learned so much more music as well. So it's, it's just amazing amount of learning, much more than any school can provide and focused on what the child is really interested in. Uh, well, not neglecting. It's not like you're sitting in your room reading books and your children uh, go and watch TV and eat marshmallows. Yeah. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in, in, it's not so much the neglect, my concern is that instead of we raising the children, the industry raises the children, right? If we give them hours and hours of indoctrination and brainwash with ideas of uh, cartoons, uh, which are full of subliminal advertisements and, and junk food that gets the body addicted to more junk food, etc., then it's not so much that we neglect them, it's that we abolish our job and let someone else do the job. And the industry doesn't do the kind of job that I would want for my children. But some people find a good balance where, you know, some, some you know, watching TV and eating junk and talking about it. Some parents claim that children become pretty balanced um, with, with just, you know, being open and conversing about all the pros and cons of things. And, you know, I was successful at that in terms of video games. We explored together the pros and cons, and the kids were pretty balanced about it. But not every child is the same. I would say when parents pride themselves with, you can be balanced, and my kids can have the marshmallows and the TV because they know to balance themselves because we talk about this, etc. That's that kid. <laughs> That's not everybody's kid because I have families who call me desperate. You know, they, they started in this balanced way and now the, the child has spent four years doing nothing but computer or, or video games or TV and not engaging in anything else and, and addicted to sugar and shopping and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, everything has to be in balance and we need to respond to who the child is and what they really need. Some children need a little structure. Uh, some ch the children need you to hire a teacher for them like I need it. I couldn't teach my child cello or violin or conducting. Uh, so I needed to get teachers for them to do that. Um, but a lot of things they can, yeah, I sometimes would sit and write an article and they play out in the forest, go for a little hike, come back, do their own thing. And then all of a sudden burst into the house, mom, I'm hungry, we're hungry, or make their own food when they were older, but just calling me to take care of them for one thing or another. And they're covered with mud and their big smiles and they've learned so much through laughter and, and digging in the mud and getting ants and getting stones and telling me all these fantastic things they have just discovered in the world. That's great. You covered so many questions that I had for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I answer, but maybe I've answered some of your future questions. Yes, but, but it was wonderful. It was wonderful. I, I have one we more. A little over time. Anyway, we started, okay. we started at almost half past so we, we still have time okay i wanted to ask you uh, people also are afraid that the homeschooling children cannot learn independence so they see they the better option what independence independent they will become dependent on family they will not be independent in life it's backward 
Yes, I know, but it's often often asked question how they can learn independence when they are uh, with mom <laughs> all the time. But uh, when they send them to school where they are actually separated but cannot independently and become dependent on teachers, <laughs> yes, yes, what to do for the majority of time? So should homeschooling families worry about the future independence of their children? It depends how they do it. Uh, what makes a child dependent is more school than, than um, homeschool. But a child can go to school and at the end it depends on the, the parents, whether the child, the child can go to school and stay independent thinker if the parents support them to be themselves. And it's the same with homeschooling. If the homeschooling is Uh, an environment that's very indoctrinated like school like this is the way we do it and this is the only right way and you have to be a good boy and please your mother and do your you know your school work or be the best at this or the you know achieve uh, according even if it's your passion but now you have to achieve on my terms then you can create dependence anywhere Uh, a lot easier to create dependence in school. And for most kids, the school is a huge dependence because you, you have 12 years of being taught that you are dependent on teachers planning what to study, that you don't know what you want to learn, somebody else decides for you, that you, d you don't know how long you want to stay with it, the bell rings and decides for you, that you have to be tested on it to see if you actually complied and know the material. And, You know, the whole thing is so controlling that you actually learn dependency all the time and you want to be the good boy, the good girl that comply, comply, comply. So if anything, school trains you to become a follower, to fit in in a negative way, to be like everybody else, to be, you know, the good, the good kid, so to speak. Uh, and at home that can happen but rarely does so to turn a home where children are free to be independent from day one and make them dependent on the parents is extremely unlikely and it's extremely difficult to do uh, the parents would have to be some you know dogmatic controlling you know like they become school Has to be this way. So I would say with the unschooling movement, it's not available. It's not going to happen. Okay. With the homeschooling movement, it's a danger, not as much as school, but yeah, one has to watch. So the way to watch, so the, the next question will be, so how do you avoid that? Well, you make sure that the child is leading the way in terms of what they learn, when they want to practice or learn or study something and that you're not mending in their life, and that you don't praise them, so you don't show expectation, oh, that's good that you did that, this was good to win this competition, to do this good, uh, or to read this book, or whatever it is, uh, that you stay neutral, just escorting them on their path. It's not your path, absolutely so, not your path. And that, that yeah. is hard to do. Um, especially if a child is on a passion that is a great talent, um, that you, it's very hard not to get involved in wanting them to succeed and they sense that. So some degree of that, and that's the third part of my answer, some degree of dependence on parents is unavoidable, um, not because of schooling as much as because of nature, life. You know, the baby is dependent for survival on mother, The child is dependent for survival on the parents for many years. So how do they get out of that dependence? What does that have to do with homeschooling? Hey, you feed them for 18 years or 20 years or 16 or whatever. How will they be de not dependent and learn to feed themselves? So I encourage parents to just see that children gradually, as they grow up, do become independent because they want to because that's how nature designed them. If you don't get in the way, if you don't go into dogma that you have to do things my way, and you embrace that your child dresses differently, has different philosophy, whatever it is, to encourage that. You know, you think this way, I think this way, that's fine, we don't have to think the same. I used to tell my children, uh, when we listen to music together, like, oh, you love that song, I don't. I like that other song. 
uh, and accentuate that to let them know we don't have to be the same person. And believe me, even with me, I can see over-dependence happened with my children to some degree. It's nothing to do with homeschooling. It happens with parents whose children go to school, especially when they get the best grades, when they're the good students because they're pleasing the teachers, pleasing their parents. So now they have double dependency. Um, so dependency is a big subject and the way to not be dependent, and this is the core answer that I think you're waiting for, is to make sure that their autonomous choices are respected. And that starts in babyhood. That has also nothing to do with homeschooling. If they want to sleep with you, for example, you tell them, no, you have to sleep by yourself now, you're three years old or four years old or whatever. You just told them be dependent. Do not what you feel inside independently. Do what someone else tells you to do. Someone else knows better what's right for you. So you should depend on other people to tell you what to do. And that's why I say, you know, with food, have only healthy food at home. Because if you start telling your children, you can't eat that, you can't eat that, it's not good for you. Again, you're telling them what you feel inside. Your hunger tells you you want to go and get that chocolate bar. And you're telling them this is not good for you. Well, you're telling them how you feel inside is wrong. Don't listen to yourself. Or you tell them, kiss grandma goodbye. And they don't want to kiss grandma you're actually setting them up for molestation. You're telling them, you know, someone else has consent over your body and you should do what someone else tells you to do. Uh, or you tell them to say, like you said in the beginning, please or thank you, and they don't feel it or it's not authentically what comes for them. And someone else should tell me what to say. So now they go as a young adult to a social situation and they go like, gee, I don't know what to say. You know, what do you want them to call their mom and ask them, what should I say? <laughs> or to call the teacher in school to ask, what should I say? No, you hope that they spend their childhood encouraged and supported in following their own voice, going to sleep when they're tired, eating when they're hungry choosing what to work on, which is their passion, when they have the passion, and not talking to someone and not giving the kiss or the thank you when it's not their thing. You know, one of my children once, not just once, this happened a lot, he was not into talking to people. He was very shy. He wasn't really shy as much as introvert and allergic to patronizing adult behavior. And towards children, people are naturally patronizing in our culture. Your culture, my culture, it's the same everywhere. Uh, my culture, not as much. There's more and more people that already don't do that. But what I saw in Europe, uh, I saw a lot of that. So an adult would come to him like he's seven years old, tap on his head. Oh, Lennon, how are you? So what are you doing these days? And my son looks him straight in the eye, almost with anger, doesn't answer. You know, I love that, you know, so authentic. <laughs> so the adult kind of goes like, come on, Lennon, what like, grade are you in now? Or whatever they ask. And I say to the adult, excuse me, no touching without permission. That's number one, right? And then it doesn't look like he wants to talk to you. If you're looking for a conversation, I'll talk to you. And in this particular occasion, the next thing the adult asked me is something about my son. And I said to him, well, if you want me to talk about him, I have to ask his permission to do that. You know, so many times we talk about a child in front of them. And I've made that mistake. I'm not perfect. You know, bragging about my kid achievement right in front of them, et cetera. Uh, I've failed in that way many times. It's very hard not to. But when it's the child's message and a person asks personal questions about the child in front of him, you know, would we do that as adults? You and I talk and, and, this, and John is standing right here and you and I talk about John. <laughs> like, what do you think about you know, What is he doing these days? <laughs> I can ask him directly. And if he doesn't want to talk to me, well, I guess I'm not going to know about John today. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So those kind of things help children and also validating their feelings. You know, if a child says, oh, it hurts and I cry and you tell them, oh, nothing happened, don't cry. We're telling them to not be independent. We're telling them don't trust how you feel inside. What they feel inside is right. So I know what the next question could be, maybe not on your list, but a parent may ask me, yeah, but what if they're doing something that I have to stop them from doing? Uh, it's not safe or it's not right for another child or whatever. And I say, that's fine. You can stop hitting you, a, a hitting situation or breaking something. You can validate the feeling. The child may be upset and burst out crying because they really wanted that toy, but it belongs on the shelf in the store or whatever. And you could still teach them how you feel inside is right. You really wanted that toy. You really wanted to take that bucket from that child, that pail from that child on the scent pile. You really thought that red and blue bucket was gorgeous and you really wanted it. I understand. Or you wanted to stay outside and whatever happened, we had to go. Or you had to leave the swimming pool because they closed and you really wanted to stay more. And you give them a hug. You don't make drama out of it. You let them finish crying. And they know that you totally understand them. You're totally on their side. You don't fix the problem because then you teach them to be dependent on always getting their way, which is another whole subject. We won't go there. We won't stay with the homeschooling. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, another belief is that uh, they learn independence through the peers. That uh, when they go, uh, when they meet peers, they uh, go away from the parents, mm -hmm. and this is how they learn independence. What's true about that? Well, first of all, peers mean the same age. Children yeah. never have to be with other children of the same age that's actually not very useful. It's not that some of them couldn't be the same age, you know, after age 10 or so, uh, they're perfectly capable of playing, playing peacefully together with kids of similar age. But especially in the younger years, it's better for them to be with somebody older, more like a tribe or an extended family, I would say in terms of ages. Having, uh, playing with just a couple, not a whole group. Putting them in a group is a school idea. It doesn't work without an adult control. So number of kids that can't play by themselves without, you know, one of them is older. Um, so different ages is essential. It's very good for them to play with other kids. Uh, I'm not saying that it's not a good thing, but not with peers. So I'm, I'm just peering into the concept of peers. That's not useful. That's actually destructive. Um, the whole problem of peer pressure that comes later is being ignored by a lot of parents. A peer can be destructive actually, because what children are learning is to be like everybody else, which the fact that they're the same age is reinforcing. Everybody has to dress the same, put makeup the same, uh, behave the same, be cool the same, have sex already because others do, uh, or kiss a girl already because others did, or be kissed because others did. So there's a lot of actual dangers in the peer that take you away from the other question, the independence. So you don't learn to be independent with a peer group. You learn to be independent from being rooted in yourself, whoever you are with. And it's easier to stay independent when you are only with few people, a number that doesn't need an adult leader telling you what to do. So two or three kids, four kids in older ages, sometimes five uh, or a few more can do, can do things together without adult intervention. Um, and being a range of ages so that somebody can be, uh, you know, taking care of these things and somebody of these things. And maybe the youngest kids is almost being parented by the teenager, by the, the older one. So, so no, peers don't make us uh, independent, but dependent, actually. And independence is something that is learned at home from day one, from birth. And okay, thank you. Other things That's I would great. talk about, yes. Um, another thing that parents are afraid a lot is uh, what will happen if their child wants to go to college one day and they have to pass exams 
for example. Yeah. Uh, they start to think about their future college, college education almost at a preschool age and believe that children must prepare continuously step by step, you know, for example, in math, even if kids are not interested in it. Yeah. Uh, parents fear that if they won't prepare them from the beginning, they won't make it when needed. Do you have some example in this topic? Yeah, I have a great example. When you're pregnant, do you send into your belly pipes for the baby to learn to breathe so that when he comes out, he knows to breathe? It's the same thing. Children don't need to learn at age five what they will need to know at age 20. If you notice through childhood and from babyhood, they seem to get to a certain age and the thing matures in here. The frontal cortex, that's what it needs to do. Transitional ages, hormones. And then all of a sudden they're capable of doing this, of doing that. I have so many stories to demonstrate that. One of them is uh, my oldest son, um, and actually I have some stories from clients with the same kind of stories. Because when the brain mature to be able to do something, and why torment them from 12 years? Um, before I tell you about the, the older son, all my kids went to colleges and they studied for the tests that are equivalent to finish high school. One took him at age 15, three weeks. Because, and I asked him, how can you learn in three weeks what they teach in, 18 year, in 13 years? Are you a genius or what? He said, no, I'm not a genius. This is not that much to learn. <laughs> I don't know what takes them 12 years. Well, I know what takes them 12 years because the conditions for learning in a classroom of same age children sitting and doing what they don't want to do by a control of adult is the worst condition for learning. You can't learn this way. Uh, there's fear in it. There is an anxiety in it. There is the setting up, you know, the tempo of learning with a whole group of kids. It's just, you know, kids can't teach each other because they're all the same age and on and on. It's just, yeah, it takes years. While when children sit on their own and just take it at age 18, the whole thing together, um, my other kids studied a couple of months to, to pass and get into college. And uh, the other one actually went at age 16 to uh, what's called the Running Start program here, where you can go to college instead of high school. And he accumulated so many credits that when he went to the university, he already was half done. So he finished university in two years and he never had to do those exams. Yeah, that's He's great. Had credits. Uh, so uh, there are lots of ways. And some people get into colleges of their choice simply by having an interview with the dean. And, and the dean feels so inspired that some, finally, not somebody who's just a good boy with the good grades and all the teachers say is great, but somebody who talks for themselves and actually gave thought to why they want to be in this school and what, why they're excited about it. So usually they, those interviews have phenomenal reports by the university deans being so, so impressed. But uh, what I was going to say about the brain development, the story I was going to tell is about uh, my oldest son. When he decided to go to uh, a university, um, he said to me, well, I'm going to do those tests. And I said, do you need anything? And do you need a tutor for math? Because he was the one kid of mine who was not interested in math at all over the years. He was an avid reader. He knew history and biography and science. He was into everything, but not math, not grammar, not those things. Well, grammar, yes, because he's also a writer. Um, anyway, so I said, do you need a teacher? And he said, no, I already got the book with the math. And I looked in the middle, And I looked at the end and I solved the problem based on the explanation. And if you read the explanation, you know to solve the problem. You don't need a teacher. So he studied it. He passed the test and he went to college. Uh, so I asked myself again, 12 years of college. Well, the mistake is it doesn't have to take 12 years. It takes 12 years in an abnormal conditions. The same in the democratic school in Boston where kids wanted to learn math and he ended up, they asked the teacher, and they went through six years of middle school, um, not six, more, until sixth grade, so it's like seven years, um, 
they went through uh, six weeks of classes of once or twice a week classes and covered the whole material. <laughs> because, That's funny. Yeah, because they wanted to. They were excited. They initiated it. And it's not that much material when you have a group of five kids with one scientist who are just nuts about it and want to do it. So it's not that much material. They don't need to be tormented for 12 years. And remember, they're being taken away from what they would have learned that would have made their passion and profession go forward. So it's not only that they don't need it. Well, oh, well, we did teach it to them from age five. Not a disaster. They know it this way or that way. No, it's a loss. Because those 12 years, you know, when at age 10, you're teaching them what they need at age 20. And at age 10, they need to be free to pursue their own passions so that by age 20, they're actually already far into their science or gymnastics or whatever it is. So we are actually depriving them and we are teaching them to be dependent again. Yes, respecting authority. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the whole process the of teaching them direction. to be dependent. I don't know what I should learn. Somebody should tell me what I should learn, when I should learn, that I should pass test, that I you know, the whole testing uh, idea is so patronizing and controlling and, and really revolting. How can you we know like human beings? Yes, you know, but parents also, when they are sending them to school, they don't see them the full day. So they want to make it transparent that the child is learning something that they are not sending them for nothing. Right. I know, so that even the parents want the child to be tested. Yeah, they, I, I've seen that. Not so much in America, but, but again, that's because the, when you homeschool, you have to homeschool yourself too. You have to unschool yourself. You have to work on yourself. And a lot of the private sessions I give, and uh, you know, people know probably that I give via Skype or Zoom or phone or email if people want. If they don't speak the language, well, sometimes they prefer to converse by email. Um, I, I do private sessions that they can sign up for online. I also have web classes and past web classes are online now that people can buy and learn a lot. Um, so I would say a lot of parents call me for some emotional issues and behavioral issues, but also a lot of parents uh, call me about raising themselves to be unschooled enough to not be anxious about what the children learn, because the anxiety, what will they learn at age 15, when we have it when the child is only seven, we are going to control the child and do a lot of damage. The truth is, and this is what can relax anybody that is willing to transform themselves. If children did nothing but played all day for the first 12, 15 years of their lives, they would be so secure emotionally, so clear of themselves, independent and capable through play, because play is learning. It's the best learning, which is why all mammals' uh, uh, offsprings play. That's how they learn. You, you see it in nature among animals. They play to learn. Human beings play to learn. If we let them play, they will learn their social, their physics, nature, biology, they'll learn so much. They may not have the academic words for it, but they would learn and would master the world just fine. And then if by the age that they feel like, well, I need to kind of fit in and know the academic terms, etc., which also happens gradually because they talk to their parents and they read in books and they go online. So it's not a even if they play all day, it's not like they wouldn't be exposed to other things. But if mostly we nurtured them, fed them, loved them, and let them play all day until age, each one different between 12 and 16, 17, they come up with their need then. And in a few weeks to a few months, they would cover the whole material of school in no time. Just like they learn to walk, just like they learn to breathe, just like they learn to talk quite abrupt too. 
a little slower, more complex. It's the hardest thing to learn, to learn a whole language and the concept of language. And they master it on their own. What are we thinking that we need to do something? You know, they master language. There's nothing more difficult to figure out from listening to parents you don't have an x-ray into their mouth to figure out what to do with your tongue and lips and, and, and muscles to produce specific sounds and to understand that it means something, a concept, love, I want, what is wanting? You know, those are abstract concepts, let alone, you know, it's the simple stuff saying this is a book, this is a computer, this is a chair. But they understand concepts. You know, by age three, most of them are speaking quite a rich language with lots and lots of concepts that are totally abstract and invention of the mind. If they can master that, and walking and doing things with their head. I mean, they're, you know, they're a learning machine. Just don't get in the way. They're a learning machine. School gets in the way. And, you know, I'm not one of the fanatic things who people who think you should never send your kids to school. And if you can't not send them to school for one reason or another, how you are with them at home and about school can still make a difference in keeping them thinking for themselves, being independent, realizing, okay, I'm complying with this school, but that's not the way to be. And it does not mean that I have to depend on others what to do. That's important to keep in mind. Uh, and also there are schools that nurture the self-connection, like the democratic schools, the Reggio yes. Emilia schools, and a lot of others that don't have a specific global name, just private schools in Seattle, there is a school simply called free school. Um, and they don't even have a building. They just gather together, they have no costs, no nothing, it's free in every way. And they just explore things based on whatever the children want to do and do volunteer work and do all kinds of things. It's called the Seattle free school. Um, so I'm sure other cities and small places have all kinds of variations of schools that are the equivalent of homeschooling or unschooling, just doing it in a group. I public skip, uh, speak in Europe a lot. Uh, I may come again in the fall. That's, that's in the works, by the way. Uh, but when I go to Europe, I always go to Arco School in Switzerland, in Bern. And Arco School is actually subsidized by the government homeschooling group that has this home, a building, a big building, like an estate with a yard and everything, with view and everything. And they just designated different rooms in the building for different, you know, geography room, gymnastic room, music room, with tools that the parents keep donating and bringing in. And the kids and parents come every day, stay as long as they want, and do things together. The disadvantage of homeschooling is the isolation. So that's the one thing I tell parents, do find, you know, it, you need a community. So Arco School is a fantastic solution. If you can get to decide, well, one home or a few homes or each day, different parent home or a bunch of, you know, three, four, seven, ten kids, different ages come together uh, every other day, twice a week, anything like that is very important and very, very useful. In the ARCO school, they are there every day, but they don't have to. And I don't know how their sign-up situation is uh, just in terms of safety, because some kids are there maybe without the parents and somebody is keeping a log, I assume. Uh, but it's a beautiful place. And the facility has three levels with rooms and kitchen and, you know, children can do art, children can learn things. And let me say one thing that important in the young ages to get kids into, they want to, that's what they like to do, is the arts. So if we, if we do things with them for fun, you know, dance with them, take them to the opera, to concerts, to theater, act with them, uh, have paint and, and papers and Play-Doh and clay, uh, expose them to museums, just the creative part will make them able to learn anything. That's that human capability to create will then 
be useful for them. They will bring that creative mind, that creative frame of reference into learn math and do the numbers from left to right with that kind of creativity. Yeah, that's great. I think we are out of time. Do I have time for one more question or we have to? We'll, we'll get over time. That's fine. One more question. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have to say about the situation in our country because politicians here automatically look, automatically, automatically look at parents um, as they fail in raising their children responsibly. So they ordered parents to enroll kids even to preschool or at least let children go for testing if you decide to homeschool them. Uh, unlike United States, all provinces in Canada or Great Britain and other countries where parents have the highest authority to yeah. make decisions about their child's education. In our country, the unschooling or free democratic schools are still illegal. And if you want to homeschool, you have to follow some curriculum, mm -hmm. universal curriculum for schools, and go with your child for testing twice a year, for the nine years at least. So what would you recommend to those parents in these conditions for parents who feel that self-directed learning is suits their children best, yeah. but are restricted by law in such way they cannot send them to free democratic school nor unschool or, you know, what would you recommend these families? Or well, or if, you know, I know some families who move to other countries for that reason. We sometimes well. <laughs> in America who do that, who come here from Germany. We had a famous family, actually, that it kind of became the news because America didn't let them in or something. I don't remember exactly what happened. Um, so I know some families who move for that reason and find it a great opportunity to learn other languages. Uh, I know one family that got themselves a sailboat and went for 10 years around the world. Oh. Phenomenal phenomenal learning nothing like it <laughs> uh, you know all you know the, the, they raised uh, two girls uh, that uh, uh, totally you know know so much about the seas and nature and geography and people and cultures and unbelievable um, so there are those kind of ways but I would say if you have to stay in the country for language job you know whatever the conditions there are lots of reasons why one should stay in their own uh, place then the thing is to make peace with that and to validate the child's feeling about hating those tests and <laughs> it's like you know we have to do it it's like we have to take a bath and wash your hair I know you don't like it but you know, some things, we have to brush our teeth in the morning. So, hey, you know, we live in this country. Let's try to do the best we can uh, to be free in spite of this. Because truthfully, it's not that hard to pass those tests. That's what to keep in mind. Just like you can prepare in three weeks for the tests to go to the university or two months for other people. It doesn't have to be three weeks, whatever it is. So twice a year test means that probably two weeks would prepare them, maybe a month. So instead of being anxious the whole half a year, maybe do something about it once a week, if that's your method, you know, let's cover some of the stuff so that you would feel better. Uh, and if you start after a few tests like that, learning, okay, really in the last two weeks, we do most of the learning, then we pass the test. And you're honest with the child. Look, that's the law. I don't like it either. Let's just plow through this material uh, so that we can play all day. So you still do your homeschooling. You still follow their passion. And then they know very clearly, okay, there is this police state <laughs> with this obligation that we have to do. So they live in peace with that because it's not the only thing that as society we have to do. Yeah, it's wrong, but there are a lot of wrong things happening in society that are politically controlled. And, you know, so that's, that's what we do. What can, you know? So, you know, we have them even in America, in, in, in health. We don't have the, the right kind of health insurance to allow people to use all kinds of practitioners, not just Western medicine. And there are lots of other things that you have to comply with. You know, if I want to build a little... Uh, even tree house or something a little bigger than something for the kids out. I have to get permits 
you know, in my country, you know, in terms of building. So children, it's, it's a learning process. You tell, that's the country we're in. That's what we have to do. And with that kind of attitude, they would not be damaged by it. It's not the end of the world. Just make sure the, the thing for the parent is not to be anxious and not to think, just like we said, they don't have to learn all their lives to get into college. They can do it in the last few months. They don't have to learn for the whole uh, half a year to pass the test. You don't have to have a struggle with your kid every morning, two hours, study or school stuff. Let them play. You know, and do it toward the end or once a week or you know, find a way to keep the freedom free and to frame it with validation so that it's not an issue. Just okay, thank so. you very much. That was great. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's I part like of learning think. how to be in the world, by the way. It's, it's a great it's the real world. Yeah, it's the real world. And in yes. this country, that's what we have to do. You know, yes. we live in apartments or we live in houses. We have to pay our taxes uh, it, with a car. If we drive, we have to do it this way. If we want to take the train, we have to be there ahead of time, get a ticket. And when we're children, you know, twice a year, we have to go through this few uh, tormenting ourselves with this whatever knowledge they want and then regurgitate it and put it on the paper for them and then you're done for another half year <laughs> it's life it's, it's learning to be in this society it's not the end of the world it's really can be used quite well and then they may learn something in the process and get interested in something you know, mom, I hated the tests, but you know, this little thing we did in grammar really got me interested in some of those languages. Who knows? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your answers and your time. It was great pleasure. Um, Thank you. And uh, I will, yes. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I will have to share these thoughts with other parents who are struggling with this legal legal issues and i think they find it very useful yes. so thank you very much thank you you're welcome i'll see you again olga okay thank you bye bye, bye.